Ms. Uh, Lansman. Thanks uh, for uh, for joining us. I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to uh, to what we were talking about when the minister was here. And while we appreciate um, the work and speed at which agencies acted when they had the information, um, I can understand why people would say that that's how the system works. What we haven't got to the bottom of here today is our concern about why you didn't have the information after this individual had been in this country for six years. And from the chronology that you provided this committee right before it started, had six different incidents of security checks. I'm going to ask you, um, whether it's Mr. McCory or Ms. Lloyd, how can Canadians be sure that there are the, the, the proper checks in the system to make sure that this didn't happen before, that there aren't terrorists in our midst, and that this won't happen again. You can appreciate the Canadians want the answer to that question. Mr. Chair, I can start, and then Vanessa, if you want to join in. Uh, thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. What I'd like to describe is, in fact, I think we have a very robust system in place when it comes to security screening. You've heard a little bit in the previous session. It starts with the assessment that is done by our colleagues in the IRCC, and then based on risk indicators, comprehensive files are referred to uh, the CBSA and CSIS to do comprehensive security screening. And we can describe more detail what is, is entailed in that, but I'd say from a CBSA point of view, it's about understanding the person who's in front of us, reviewing the information that we have, understanding their travel history, their work history, where they're coming from, and then doing in-depth analysis, both in terms of, of open source research, but also running names and information aliases against our, our, our range of our intelligence and enforcement databases. If necessary, then we also dig into further getting information from domestic as well as international partners. Um, and, then, and, and then we provide a recommendation uh, to our IRCC in terms of, but if, if I, sorry, yeah, I, I, that that has all been covered. I, right. I just want you to appreciate that after that this individual who is on allegedly on an ISIS video from 2015 that was publicly available has been in this country for six years before the RCMP thwarted a terrorist plot that would have killed people in the GTA somewhere in Toronto, presumably after uh, after six security checks. You can appreciate why Canadians are concerned, can't you? So, so uh, again, our foremost, our outcome, the goal that we're, we're, we're focused on is ensuring the protection of Canada and Canadians. And so when we make our decisions, when we do our analysis, it's based on the information that we have available at any given moment in time. The so best. you think this is the most robust process that I could have happened in this case? I You're telling Canadians that? I'm telling Canadians that we have a robust system in place, but as the minister indicated as well earlier, we are asking ourselves, do improvements need to be made? So we are. So there wasn't review. a failure in this. I, I would go back to the point is that we've made the best decisions we can at those moments in time with the information that was available. So, so Canadians, Canadians watching this see that, again, six security checks, six years of this individual who was publicly on an ISIS videotape, who is now behind bars uh, or being held on very serious terrorism charges. Um, you think the system, like, you, you really believe that the system worked as it should. As the minister, he dismissed anything that, that was wrong with the system here today in, in his testimony. You really think that that's how the system should work here. You're really telling Canadians who are watching at home that the system is robust and everything worked as it should in this case. What I'm telling Canadians is we're asking ourselves, can there be improvements made to the system? We're taking a very hard look at that. We're doing that in collaboration with our partners in, this, in CSIS, in the IRCC. Uh, we're going to do a representative sample of cases that have had positive uh, assessments in the past and ask ourselves, have we missed anything? Are there any systemic issues, any gaps in our have processes? Anything. There's been six incidents of, of security checks here. Of, of course you've missed something. These guys were just arrested. A father-son duo were just arrested in a hotel room 10 minutes from the riding that I represent and within 40 minutes of the riding that committee members here represent. Of course you've missed something. Has there been any consequences for anybody who has been involved in any of these checks? There's nothing to indicate at this moment in time that we had information available to us when we made those decisions that would... That's a problem? I'm, I'm saying we're asking ourselves if we need to review some of our processes and systems. I, I, I appreciate that you're asking yourself these questions, but don't you think it's a problem that you didn't know that this guy was awarded a visa here 
six years ago after being in an ISIS video from 2015 that is publicly available and was arrested with his son days before committing a terrorist attack. I, I'm apologizing, and I just have to repeat that, in fact, we made the best decisions that we can could at that moment in time based on the information that we had. I think we have robust systems in place, but we are asking ourselves, can we do more? And we're looking backwards to see if, in fact, we need to do I more. I don't think there is a single Canadian watching today that would agree that you have robust systems in place if this is what happened. I don't think there's a single Canadian today watching saying, you know what, the system worked exactly as it should. What have, happened? Where were the failures? Why did this government fail? I'm not sure there are any failures. Again, we, will, we are going to do a respective view and to see if there's more, if we missed anything. And if there is, we will make corrections. We have 183 staff at CBSA that every day are conducting security screening. About 206,000 per year we get coming our way, and we, did, we issued about, um, I want to say, 130, 130 decisions last year. So who slipped through the cracks. Can you assure Canadians that there hasn't been any more, that there aren't terrorists in our midst, that this won't happen in the future? I know, I appreciate that you think that this is a robust system that worked exactly as it should, but I think people watching this would disagree with you. What I would assure Canadians is that we have multiple lines of defence in place, so if we don't capture them at the stage of security screening, we also look at people coming to the country. And as you heard from earlier testimony, about 7,500 people were uh, no boarded prior to even uh, departing for Canada. About, um, I want to say about 37,000 people were uh, turned away from Canada upon entry. And then we have an additional line of defence in terms of our inland investigations. So last year we launched 88,000 inland investigations based on concerns about inadmissibility. When we find an admissibility, we take those cases to the Immigration Refugee Board, who's a decision maker. Last year, we removed 15,000 people, of which about seven, 800 were serious in admissibility. So there's multiple lines of defense that are in place. We don't rely on a single point of failure. We have multiple lines of defense, and we're asking ourselves, our imp do improvements need to be made? And that's, I think, a powerful message for Canadians is we do want to know if improvements can be made, and if they can, there can be, we will make improvements. Thank you, Ms. Lanceman. We go now to Mr. Gahir. Uh, Mr. Gahir, go ahead, six minutes, please. Uh, great, thank you, Chair. So I wanted to touch on the line of questioning that Ms. Lanson was asking. Uh, we in Canada obviously have tens and hundreds of thousands of people that seek to get a visitor visa to come to Canada, uh, and there's security screening processes to make sure that the wrong individuals don't get access to Canada. Obviously, in this case, someone did arrive in Canada and then filed a, an asylum claim. Um, is it theoretically even possible to search every single video or to conduct a global facial recognition search uh, on, on every video for the individuals that are applying for visitor visas to Canada? And can we even, do we even have the resources to scour the dark web for every single individual that applies for a visitor visa to Canada? Is that even possible, theoretically? Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. I can start off by talking about how we initially screen uh, temporary resident applicants, so those coming in to visit Canada. Every application for an individual who wants to come to Canada as a visitor is screened by the IRCC with that initial security screening. And so we look at biometrics. Biometrics helps us not only to identify whether or not there's any criminality that is known, but it also helps us to, uh, in, in terms of identity management, this is the first time that we're seeing an individual and we anchor that identity for the individual throughout the entire process. Our officers are uh, highly trained in different risk indicators. These risk indicators are created collaboratively with our partners at the CBSA and at CSIS. Those risk indicators are clues for the officers when they're going through an application on where there might be some type of elevated risk or where there might be um, an opening so to... Just, just to interrupt, once we've reached that elevated level of risk for that pool of people, is it possible then to conduct a dark web search or a facial recognition search for all the content on the internet in the world for those individuals? I don't, I don't think that's theoretically even possible, no? My colleagues at CBSA or CSIS who would then at that point conduct a comprehensive security screening if we referred the application. 
Vanessa, did you want to? Certainly, perhaps I can jump in, Mr. Chair. Um, so I, I will refer to the, the members of the committee to the information that's put to before them in terms of the range of other tools that are available in, in each and every case. And so upon referral where we do have indications of a possible national security uh, concern, a risk indicator, doesn't mean that there is information present at that time, uh, we can apply a range of tools. And you'll see in the material that we put to the committee that that can include, as we discussed this morning, checks with international national partners, um, uh, reviews of open sources and other tools. I, I will refrain from getting into the specifics of our capabilities as it relates to the members' uh, specific question in terms of uh, technical uh, methods technical capabilities and methodologies. Um, uh, but what I can say uh, in answer to part of the concern I'm hearing from the committee is that while I said this morning there is an increasing and intensifying risk as it relates to uh, violent extremism, uh, the members should be um, assured and Canadians should be assured that there is a very small number of people who are present in Canada who are willing to mobilize to violence. So I still want to focus on the question regarding scouring the dark web. Um, should our law enforcement be scouring the dark web when it comes to conducting routine security screens, assessments? I would say from a CBSA point of view, and, and, and uh, Ted Gallivan alluded to this earlier, we are asking ourselves, do we need to do more in that particular space? So as part of the review, we're asking ourselves, what's the feasibility of that? What would it take from a technology point of view? And what would be the usability of the information that we'd get from that and the feasibility of us finding it? It is a daunting challenge, but we are asking ourselves that question. Thank you. Chair, how much time do I have left? Uh, two minutes. Two minutes, okay. So uh, I wanted to ask a question about the difference between an individual that has gotten a visitor visa that lands in Canada, let's say at Pearson Airport, which is in my riding, and that files for asylum at that airport, which is an inland claim, uh, versus an individual that makes a claim prior to entering to Canada. Because Can anyone on the panel speak to the different legal protections that are afforded to those two individuals, or maybe the, the, how different the processes are for those two streams? Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. Um, what I can say is that as you mentioned, every individual who is in Canada who claims asylum is subject to 100% security screening by our partners at the CBSA and CSIS. So that comprehensive security screening is conducted on every asylum claimant in Canada. With individuals who are looking to seek asylum uh, coming into Canada from outside, they are assessed differently. I don't have all of the details as I am I'm more on the migration integrity side. They are assessed um, to determine whether or not they could become permanent residents in Canada and then they would go through, if it's approved, a permanent resident screening process. C could we have a submission to the uh, committee, I don't know if that's possible, of the difference in the security screening procedures for uh, an overseas application that's seeking asylum versus an inland application seeking asylum? We can certainly look into that. Great, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gahir. On y va maintenant, Monsieur Fortin. Now to Mr. Fortin. Mr. Fortin, go ahead, six minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My question will be for Mr. McCrory. In his testimony, Mr. McCrory told us that the system is working well as it exists and that there was no failure. So I understand that, in quotes, it's normal or common for individuals like these two to obtain the right to be in Canada, obtain Canadian citizenship and all of that. I find that concerning. I sincerely believed, and I don't think I was the only one, I sincerely believed that there had been major mistakes gaps in the system, but we're being told that there weren't. I thought there was a problem with funding. We're told it's not the case. I'd like to know, in Mr. McCrory's opinion, is this normal? What should we expect in Canada? How many individuals does he think there are like these two who are preparing terrorist attacks? Um, merci pour le 
Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. I, I, again, I, I want to reiterate that, in fact, we are concerned that these two individuals got through. Uh, and that is why, in fact, we are launching uh, a, a collaborative uh, review of our processes with our partners in the IRCC and CSIS to understand what happened and what, if anything, we could do differently. What I would say is at the moment in time that the security screening partners reviewed these files, we made decisions based on a very robust process based on the best information we had available that time. When new information becomes available, for example, when somebody is in the country, there are different steps that we take, and I won't comment on what the CSIS and RCMP may do in the criminal world, but from, an IRC, or sorry, from a CBSA point of view, if we have information regarding somebody's inadmissibility in the country, we will launch an inland investigation. As I noted, we're doing about 8,000 of those this year. Those inland investigations will assess, should this person be in the country? If not, we take that, that file, that evidence, the Immigration and Refugee Board, who, who will make a decision about whether or not that person should be removed from the country. Mr. McCrory. Mr. McCrory, I understand that once individuals are here, there are different procedures that are in place, but is there not a way to prevent them from coming here? Because if we bring people in who are terrorists, who have intentions to perpetrate terrorist attacks, in my view, I thought those individuals didn't even come to Canada. Now if we're being told that we let them in and once they're here, investigations, more robust investigations are done. Well, I find that concerning, don't you? Merci pour la question. Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. What I'm trying to describe, in fact, is the multiple layers of the defense that are in place. And I think the, the member's question is, is absolutely right in terms of our, prim, our first objective is to push the border out as far as possible. And that's, in fact, why we have a security screening process in place that starts with our colleagues in the IRCC that results in, in comprehensive security screening being done by CSIS and, uh, and the CBSA. So in 2023, we did 74,000 reviews. We had 74,000 files come our way, sorry, of which we closed 38,000 in terms of people seeking to come to the country. That's the first line of defense. First IRCC, then our security review, comprehensive security review. If somebody is on a plane or on a flight manifest on their way to the country, CBSA has additional defenses or tools that we bring to bear, other lines of defense. So we have our national targeting center that reviews all passenger manifests for people seeking to come to the country, and we have international liaison officers who are working overseas. They work with airlines and with local authorities to deny boarding to those people who we deem to be inadmissible, about 7,500 of them in 2023. Next line of defense is, the, is at the port of entry. We have highly trained and experienced border services officers. Okay, Mr. McCrory, Mr. McCrory, I'm sorry to run trip to you. I don't want to be impolite, but I only have six minutes to ask questions. I understand from your answer, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you've done everything you could do with the tools you had, you and your colleagues. But you also added earlier... Prove we will improve it. Have you any suggestions? Do you have suggestions? What can be done? I understand the 38,000 cases, but what can be done to improve the screening process to prevent this from happening again, in your opinion? It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the question. It is a great question. We're asking ourselves this right now. I don't have any immediate views in terms of what changes, of any, that we need to make. But I am working with my colleagues who are at the table with me today so that we can understand what happened and, again, if necessary, make any changes that we need to. The system is always going to be... Clearly, there are other states, Mr. McCrory, with all due respect, there are other states that act and react more quickly than we do. We've seen that you were, we were informed by a foreign country about this individual, the crimes that had been committed elsewhere. So there are other states that manage, and with all due respect, I think everyone is competent and serious in your services, but there are people who obtain better results. So you have certain expertise in this area. Do you not have an idea before conducting studies that will take two or three years? Do we not have an idea of what we could do this week, now, to improve our screening system to prevent similar cases? First of all, I want to assure uh, the member that this is not going to be a review that's going to take a couple of years. The minister is very clear in his direction to us that, that uh, he's looking for results and information as soon as possible. So we'll be in the coming months um, uh, coming back to the minister with our recommendations and our understanding of, of what happened. I think the challenge that we're always going to be facing is, is 
we make decisions based on the information that was available at a given moment in time. Can we do a better job of collectively gathering some of that information? I don't know. We need to determine that. But if we don't have information, we can't make a, de- a contrary decision about somebody. That's the that's the, the the fundamental issue. And I'll just say, for example, we've talked about the video. Um, to CBSA's knowledge, and it's only to CBSA's knowledge, the one version that we've been able to identify was, has only been available for two years. That's that's when that information was available globally and was only available to us in the last couple of weeks. We can only use the information that we have to make decisions. Merci, monsieur. Merci. Thank you. Um, Mr. McGregor, please, six minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I think, you know, the witnesses would, would probably agree with me that uh, concerns with individuals who are uh, attempting to come to Canada is not just with a, the potential of they themselves committing uh, an act of terror or, or some kind of injustice on Canadian soil, but also the potential of some whose words may inspire or incite violence here in Canada. And, you know, I do want to note that this can happen with individuals uh, regardless of their political ideology or their religious background. We can see that covering the entire spectrum. I've been on this committee long enough to to have seen that. But I will point out one example that did make the news recently. Um, and it, this is just a, f- a few weeks o- uh, old. It, it's concerning the case of Mr. Mohammed Hovlos, who was scheduled to come to British Columbia to speak at Thompson Rivers University uh, earlier this month. Uh, He has been registered in the European Union on the Schengen information system. So he's been barred from entering Germany, uh, Norway, and the Netherlands. And I believe he was also detained and deported from Switzerland. So I I just want to use his as an example because there may be others. Uh, And I wanted to point out those countries because, of course, Germany, Norway, Netherlands, and Switzerland are strong Western democracies. They share the same values as Canada does, and I'm sure have uh, very similar outlooks as the Canadian government. So I guess in comparison with other countries which are very much aligned with Canada's approach on the world stage and share our values, um, what can we learn from other countries which... Uh, may have decided to bar certain individuals, and are there instances where those individuals, other instances where those individuals have been admitted to Canada? I, I'd just like to hear from some of the people who are with us today uh, your views on how Canada judges that information and why at times we may find ourselves at odds with some of our closest allies and partners who share our strong democratic values. Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. In terms of when an individual is inadmissible to Canada, it's based on the legislation. So the Immigration Refugee Protection Act clearly outlines the reasons why an individual would be inadmissible. Um, in a, in uh, Using the example that you provided, you mentioned uh, something similar to hate speech, Mr. Chair. So under the security inadmissibility in IRPA, there are various reasons why an individual could be inadmissible. Those include things like engaging in terrorism, being a danger to the security of Canada. Our officers must be able to meet the threshold of a reasonable grounds to believe that an individual is inadmissible based on the requirements of the legislation. When it comes to what other countries, what information other countries have um, available to them, that is relevant to their own inadmissibility requirements in those countries, which may be different than our legislation. However, we do have um, opportunity to review that if an individual has been convicted outside of Canada of an offence that if in Canada would constitute an indictable offence under an Act of Parliament or two offences not arising out of a single occurrence, then that person would be deemed inadmissible. So our officers would then work with our national security and law enforcement partners uh, as well as our council to ensure that we could meet the reasonable grounds to believe that that is an equivalent offence in Canada and therefore deem them inadmissible. Thank you for that answer. And, and perhaps my next question would be uh, to, to CSIS. Um, I, I, there's not much Canada can do uh, with individuals who become radicalized abroad. I mean, if we become aware of it, there's something we can do in preventing them from coming to Canada. 
But of course, you know, gathering that kind of intelligence can sometimes be a very difficult task. Um, I was wondering, uh, are you able to speak to um, what kind of de-radicalized af de radicalization efforts uh, the government of Canada is doing here on Canadian soil uh, so that, you know, we can prevent uh, our own permanent residents who are here already, uh, our own citizens from following uh, a pretty dark path and potentially committing a crime. Can you speak to any of the efforts or the kinds of resources that are being put into that kind of uh, work? Mr. Chair, thank you for the question. Uh, apologies, uh, member. That is, in fact, an area that is outside of my expertise, uh, and I'm unable to give you that information. Do, do any of the witnesses have anything they can add on that? Okay. I, let's see. I'll, uh, I'll leave it there, Mr. Chair, uh, for the next questioner. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McGregor.